Welcome to Beyond the Things Written. In today's episode entitled This or That Good News. And it's one of my favorite topics to talk about because it's the topic that got me out of the Jehovah's Witness religion. Broke the spell, so to speak. Often as a child, it's the first scripture you will learn. And this good news will be preached and all the inhabited earth will witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Jehovah's Witnesses appeal to this verse to motivate their flock to pioneer and to put more time in. In fact, their whole life is to be dedicated to preaching their version of the good news. But is their version of the good news part of the prophecy that Jesus made in Matthew 24? We can answer no. And we'll explain why next on Beyond the Things Written. So we're talking about this or that good news. And of course, I'm going to talk about this often on this channel, because again, it's such an important topic for me to highlight to folks that Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong on the Bible. And I found sometimes uh, some believe the organization often thinking Jehovah's Witnesses are right, mostly, or closer to the truth. And that is simply not true. Jehovah's Witnesses are just as far from uh, true Christianity as just about many of the churches of Christendom that they claim is so apostatized. So we're going to look up a few scriptures today. First, we'll talk about, well, what is it that Jehovah's Witnesses say is the good news? What is it focused on? Then we'll take a look at several scriptures that Paul mentioned. We're not going to be exhaustive and go through every single scripture. We will in the future. But for today, I think a few scriptures will suffice to show that what is in the Bible is not being preached by Jehovah's Witnesses. And therefore, uh, this different good news is not part of the prophecy of Jesus' words at Matthew chapter 24, 14. So first, let's take a look at what is it that Jehovah's Witnesses say is the good news. I encourage you to look at the Watchtower May 1st, 1981 Watchtower. So if you have that, you can look it up. It says there, uh, quoting the Watchtower, Let the honest-hearted person compare the kind of preaching of the gospel of the kingdom done by the religious systems of Christendom during all the centuries with that done by Jehovah's Witnesses since the end of World War I in 1918. Okay, so that's what we're supposed to compare it with, with the work done by Jehovah's Witnesses since 1918. So what was it that they were preaching that was the true good news? It says they are not one and the same kind. That of Jehovah's Witnesses is really gospel or good news. As of God's heavenly kingdom, that was established by the enthronement of his son, Jesus Christ, at the end of the Gentile times in 1914. So we see that Jehovah's Witness gospel is, revolves around a secret code of finding out what the Gentile times were. And of course, this was figured out by an Adventist in the 19th century. And 1914 would be the end of this Gentile times. Jehovah's Witnesses show in their publications that this is the focal point of their version of the good news. It starts at this point. The time of the end starts at this point. The signs start at this point. Now, they didn't understand that till later on. It took time to reinterpret the chronology of the 19th century. But once they did, 1919 became part of their gospel, where they were appointed, the leadership was appointed by God with the condemnation of all other Christians to be the one true Christians that God was now directing, inspiring, whatever you want to call it. You see, you're not saved by faith in Jesus. You're not saved by calling on the name of Jehovah. You're saved by associating with Christ's brothers. So these are aspects of the Jehovah's Witness gospel. 1914, 1919, being saved through associating with Christ's brothers as they misapply Matthew 25, which we'll 
uh, demonstrate in other videos. Other parts of their gospel are that all religion is to be destroyed except them. All religion is to be destroyed except them. This is part of their gospel. They believe that their interpretations of Revelation are to be taken as if it was written by Jesus Christ himself. And that this uh, is to be expected, one's life, education, what they do is to be as if these interpretations are the same as the plain words in the gospel text or in Paul's letters. So, false religion, which means any religion not Jehovah's Witnesses, will be destroyed by the United Nations, evidently. This is all part of their gospel. And then... Uh, they believe in Ezekiel 38, this Gog of Megov attack, just basically everybody attacking Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> and then God gets mad at everybody and kills everybody except them. That's Jehovah's Witness gospel. That's their version. That's their version of the gospel uh, in a nutshell. Um, so let's compare that with the Bible. Uh, was there some new light? Did there something we didn't get here? Was there new light along the way that we should change the gospel? Was it changed? Let's take a look at some scriptures. Okay, so our first scripture we're going to take a look at is probably the simplest instructions um, that you can get from, from Paul. We'll look at 1 Corinthians 15. And what's important when you're reading the Bible is in, and you're comparing it with Jehovah's Witnesses or maybe without any religion. We're focused on Jehovah's Witnesses here though, aren't we? So we always keep it with that, that context. So also think what's not there. Not just what's there, what's not there. Because what's not there is often the parts that are mostly highlighted in Jehovah's Witness world. So we start in verse Corinthians 15, and it says, Now I remind you, brothers, of the good news that I declare to you, which you also accepted, for which you have taken your stand. Through it, you are also being saved. If you hold firmly to the good news, I declare it to you. Unless you become believers for nothing. For among the first things I handed on to you was what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, yes, that he was raised up on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Kephas, or Cephas, some people call it, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still alive with us, though some have fallen asleep in death. So what did Paul say was his good news? It had to do with Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Did it have anything to do with the secret code, Gentile times, United Nations, Antichrist? No. And notice how it said that they would be saved if they continued in the gospel that he had instructed them. So it's noting the importance of not going beyond the things written. And Paul's highlighting to them because other people are, of course, changing it, even in Paul's time, as we'll take a look at. Let's take another look at a scripture also in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, probably my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. But we'll get into that for other reasons, but... In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, notice he says there, uh, So when I came to you, brothers, I did not come to you with extravagant speech or wisdom declaring the sacred secrets of God to you. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him executed on a stake. So once again, we see the good news here focused on Jesus Christ and his death. In Romans chapter 6, let's take a couple of passages there because here he's talking about what then this, this would do to a believer. What does Paul's gospel do? When one accepts this and is baptized, what is happening? What is going on with their relationship with God? We start at Romans 6 and let's just go to verse 3. It says, Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Were Jehovah's Witnesses 
Were you baptized into Jesus' death? Well, according to Paul's gospel, that is what should happen at your baptism. So we were buried with him through our baptism, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in the newness of life. So part of Paul's gospel is that our baptism is into Christ and is a sort of death and resurrection. Romans chapter 8, continuing, shows us then what this does. It says in Romans 8, starting in verse 1, and then we'll jump. It says, therefore, those in union with Christ Jesus have no condemnation. And as we go to verse 12, so then, brothers, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are sure to die. But if you put up the practices of the body to death by the Spirit, you will live. For all who are led by God's Spirit are indeed God's sons. For you did not receive the Spirit of slavery, causing fear again. You received a Spirit of adoption as sons, by which Spirit we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. If then we are children, we are also heirs, heirs indeed of God, but joint heirs with Christ, provided we suffer together so that we may also be glorified together. So, Paul's gospel here, folks. What are we talking about? Is baptism into Jesus? Did Jehovah's Witnesses, are they baptized into Jesus? No. Even the anointed, when are they baptized into Jesus? They receive the same baptism as everybody else. There's nothing unique about the anointed being baptized. Baptism, according to the Bible, according to Paul's gospel, is into Christ. And what that does is it shows there one becomes a child of God. If he has the Spirit and is led by the Spirit, he's adopted and can call God his Father. Now, perhaps we've been given some new light. We've looked at Jehovah's Witness Gospel about secret codes, 1914, 1919. We looked at the Bible. It talked about Jesus' death and resurrection, being baptized, becoming a child of God. Two completely different things. Now, when Jesus said this good news, what was he talking about? What was he talking about? Was there some new light? Was something was going to change it? Later on, would the apostles leave us? Some new light would come. We are left to show that that would not be the case. And if you have your Bibles, whatever one you have, whatever translation, follow along. Galatians 1 verse 6. Paul's talking now about the gospel. Can it be changed? He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly turning away from the one who called you with Christ's undeserved kindness to another sort of good news. Not that there is another good news, but there are certain ones who are causing you trouble and wanting to distort the good news about the Christ. The good news about the Christ. Now notice this part. However, if we, Paul and his companions, or an angel out of heaven were to declare to you as good news something beyond the good news we declare to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, I now say again, whoever is declaring to you as good news something beyond, beyond the things written, beyond what you accepted, let him be accursed. Paul is pronouncing curses on those preaching a different good news. He's saying, I can't even tell you something different. If I come to you, Paul, and tell you something different than what I told you when I first went to you, say, I'm going to be cursed. If an angel from heaven, imagine an angel from heaven, came to your bedside and said to you at night, look, 1914, got a secret code in the Bible. What are you supposed to do? 
Well, according to Paul, it cannot be changed. That person would be cursed. So if Paul can't change the good news, if an angel from heaven can't change the good news, watch our Bible Track Society sure as cannot change the good news 2,000 years later. The good news is the same good news in the first century, the second century, the fifth century, the 10th century, the 18th century, the 20th century. You see where I'm going. The same gospel of salvation, of how one returns to the family of God and restores the relationship with God is the same. It will not change. It will never change. There's only one true gospel in the Bible. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24, and this good news will be preached in all the inhabitants for witness to all the nations and then the end will come. Do Jehovah's Witnesses participate in the fulfillment of this prophecy? We answered no. And now we know why. Jesus said this good news, not this and that good news. Some good news distorted 2,000 years later based upon a secret code of putting prophetic days of 360 and seven times that and, and carrying the four divided by three and you get whoo, 1914. That's not the good news. And that is the good news that Jehovah's Witnesses are focused on. So, to review. The good news of the Bible is the same good news the first century until Christ returns. It is the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection and what that does for those exercising faith. How it restores, not even exercising, have faith. That's a Jehovah's Witness word. Those that have faith and how that restores them in their relationship with God. You become a child of God. That's the good news. So thanks for joining me again. We hope that uh, gave you something to think about. As we always say here on Beyond the Things Written, do not be afraid of them or what they say. Time is on our side. Keep well, and we'll see you next time on Beyond the Things Written.